Anyway, we uh, are very fortunate today to have uh, Marion Nachon visiting us from UC Davis, where she is uh, the beginning of a postdoctoral um, assignment with uh, Professor Don Sumner in the Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Marion comes to us from France, and uh, I happen to know, I've known her for a few years because we've both worked on the Mars Science Laboratory Curiosity rover mission. Marion actually did her PhD work uh, associated with uh, data, working on data from the ChemCam uh, instrument on the rover, and that's the, the laser, the first interplanetary laser that happens to be operating uh, very frequently and effectively on Mars. So Marilyn did her undergraduate degree at the University of Nice, the setting for the 1955 classic um, to, to Catch a Thief with Cary Grant and uh, Grace Kelly, great movie. <laughs> I haven't been to Nice for a few years, so I'm not sure if it looks the same, <laughs> but I imagine not quite, but still delightful. And from there, she uh, was lured to Paris, or just on the outskirts of Paris at Orsay, where she did a master's, uh, some master's work studying uh, the migration of active Martian dunes, so looking at planetary imagery to look at changes in, in, in real time. And then she also has done an internship with the European Space Agency, program um, in Nordvik, in the, essentially the headquarters of ESA's headquarters in the Netherlands. And then from there, she went to University of Nantes, right near uh, the border with Brittany in northwestern France, and worked with um, Professor Nicolas Mangold in the geomorphology and chemistry of uh, the, Martian, the, the, the Martian setting in Gale Crater, where the Curiosity rover is act active now. And I, uh, she just finished her doctorate degree not too long ago, <laughs> this year, right? Which month? January. Okay, so actually the same year, which was the same month of her birthday. <laughs> and so um, it's my pleasure to, enter, to uh, welcome Marion and, and let her take it from here with your talk. Go ahead. Thank you, Jen. Well, thank you very much, Jen. And thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, thanks for having me here. Actually, if may I jump to the PowerPoint then? Okay. We can, let's go for that. All right. So, as I promised in my summary, I will speak about uh, some geological features that have been analyzed by the Curiosity rover at Gale Crater. And uh, during this talk, I will follow the outline that is uh, over there on the top of my slide. So I will start during the, the first 15, 20 minutes to introduce the keywords from this title that is quite heavy. So uh, I will go from a little bit of Martian context to the explanation, a description of Gale Crater, and also uh, a description of the Curiosity rover, as well as the ChemCam instruments that I'm mentioning there. And I will also explain what I mean about diagenetic features that are just written over there. So let's start with, um, with Martian context. Uh, actually, you've got an image of, taken by one of the spacecraft, NASA spacecraft over there, one, one image that Galileo would have loved to, to have seen uh, by the time. So, so this is to give you a view both from orbit and also an image from the surface, from the surface by a rover, uh, of what the Mars surface looks like today. So currently Mars, it's uh, actually a planet that is not very friendly for life because you've got conditions pretty extreme. The temperature is in average minus 60 degrees Celsius and it's also a pretty dry planet. So this is related to the fact that the atmosphere is very thin. Uh, compared to Earth is uh, 150 uh, less thick than uh, that what we have the chance to have here on Earth. So the surface condition, actually, currently, uh, the surface of Mars are the one that our uh, average over there. We've got six millibars of pressure at the surface. The atmosphere is essentially composed of CO2, uh, so it's not even breathable for us. And all these conditions, all these physical conditions have a big impact on the, what liquid water can be at the surface. Because if you look at the diagram, the PT diagram, what you can see is that indeed at the surface with this condition, liquid water is not stable. So there is ice in uh, the subsurface of Mars. There is a tiny bit of water vapor in the atmosphere, but liquid water flowing at the surface actually, it's not something that can be achieved uh, in terms of, uh, of stability. So. And this is a big question for astrobiology, for 
people are interested in, in life topics because, as you know, life uh, on Earth, as we know it, seems to be always related to liquid water. So, so it was a bit puzzling for, for the first persons that got this data from the, the early spacecraft in the 70s. They were expecting a planet that could be very similar to ours, and they come out to discover a planet that had these current conditions. So a bit disappointing uh, for, for, for some people in terms of astrobiology, but there is a great chance that we have with Mars for geologists, is that uh, the surface of the planet is pretty old. Actually, 75% of the surface is older than 3 billion years, and this is because currently uh, the planet doesn't have tectonic plates as we have on Earth. So so indeed, there is uh, a vast majority of the surface that was not lost, that was not lost because of subduction processes as we have on Earth, and uh, and thanks to that we can analyze those rocks that were actually formed billions of years earlier. So we have this geological record on Mars. So uh, if uh, if we analyze them and if we people have been looking at them for 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 years now, uh, actually those old terrains give us a very different view from uh, what is Mars now compared to what it was in the past. And again, when I say in the past, I'm speaking at geological timescale, so millions and billions of years, not, not yesterday. Uh, so we've got several, um, I need to use this laser, it will be just easier. Uh, we have several indicators and uh, different record that indeed in the past liquid water was flowing at the surface of Mars. So we've got uh, both mineralogical evidence for that, uh, with you can see in this map of hydrated minerals on the global surface of Mars. There are indeed many uh, hydrated minerals such as phyllosilicates, sulfates, carbonates that have been detected uh, at the surface and that uh, have, uh, are interpreted as having been formed uh, in combination with liquid water. There is also uh, some in meteorites, in Martian meteorites, there are also minerals detected that have been formed with interaction, in interaction with water. Uh, another type of, of clue of evidence that we have is uh, the so-called morphological evidence with the example of these fluvial valleys carved at the surface of Mars by liquid water, just as we have them on Earth, uh, with this example being in Yemen, if I'm, not, if I'm correct. And uh, more recently, in the story of the exploration of Mars, the rovers, the landers, the in-situ uh, uh, analysis and exploration ha have given us another view and another clue that uh, liquid water was present at the surface with this example of conglomerates, which, which is basically deposits uh, of rocks in a little fluvial channel, as we know it uh, pretty, pretty well on Earth. So we've got this difference between early Mars and current Mars. So if we plot that uh, in geological time scale, the Martian one compared to the Earth one, you can see that, okay, let's plot that liquid water was present at the surface of Mars in the past, billions of years ago. And currently we know that it's not the case. Uh, so one of the first things to notice is that when liquid water was present at the surface of Mars at the same time on Earth, uh, life was uh, starting. It's it, the first uh, records, the older records that we have about Earth, about life on Earth, are from this period. This this 3.7, 3.8 uh, giga years, giga years. So one of the question is, uh, did life arise on Mars too? And if so, then how can we look for it? Or uh, also, well, we have this big question about why did we have this global transition and also could that happen to Earth? So big, big question, not only for the interest of Mars itself, but also to understand better our planet. And, uh, and in terms, if we go back to, to life and habitability, one of the questions is that was Mars habitable? Even if life did not arise on Mars, at some point, did we have condition that would have been okay and, and, and enough uh, for life to be there? So leading in relation to this, to this big question, uh, the, Mars, uh, the Mars Science Laboratory built this objective on, on this habitability 
uh, question. And this is the main goal of the mission, search as defined in, in Kratzinger et al. Uh, search for habitable environments, either past one or either also uh, assessing what are the current conditions now. No one knows if specifically at one place, maybe it might be friendly enough. So the main four objectives uh, following this, uh, this goal of the mission are to study the geology, to have an, a better idea of the evolution of the surface of Mars in terms of chemistry, mineralogy. And uh, in terms of biology, there are indeed, as we will see a little bit later, some instruments that are able to give us a little bit more precise understanding of the, some elements, such as uh, carbon, uh, phosphorus, sulfur, that might be related to, to, to life, as we know it on Earth. So assess a little bit more precisely those elements, those blocks of life. And also one, one part of the mission in general was to better understand the atmospheric evolution, uh, as well as the current water cycle and carbon cycle. And uh, also prepare a little bit the human, the future human explanation by uh, assessing the radiation at the surface. But if we go back to the habitability, uh, the landing site that was selected for this mission with this goal uh, was indeed the Gale Crater. So you've got a view, a topographic map uh, of this crater that is, uh, let's say, 150 kilometers in diameter. And one of the peculiarities of this crater is to have uh, in, this, in this central part a mount, which is informally called Mount Sharp. You might have heard of Mount Aeolis, maybe. And this mount is five kilometers high. And uh, you can see another view from here. And you've got the central peak form with uh, during the, uh, the it's a crater, the imp an impact crater. So when uh, the impactor arrived and created this crater, you had a rebound, uh, an isostatic rebound that created the mount on the center. But what's interesting for geologists is that on the lowest part of the crater, there is a deposit of 100 meters of sediments that are layered, that were deposited layer after layer. So it's actually a book for geologists to go through from the very, the most ancient sediments that were deposited at the bottom from the most recent sediments that have been deposited. And again, and this is speaking about millions and billions of years ago. So actually a pretty, pretty nice book. Uh, by selecting this landing site, so one of the interests of having this mound and this deposit is that from orbit, people working on orbital data were already able to uh, assess the fact that this layered uh, this layer deposits are composed of hydrated mineral, again, such as sulfates, phyllosilicates, you might have heard of clays. Uh, so, so this is the base of the Mount Sharp, and you can see the different minerals layer by layer. Uh, this is a, a view taken actually in situ. So, so again, this record of times when water was forming these minerals, because these minerals, are we, as we know it on Earth, form with interaction of, with liquid water. And uh, we've got the formation, uh, the datation of those, of those deposits <laughs> correspond to the time that we were, were mentioning before, like 3.5 billion years ago, so the period we were interested in. And OK, so there was also some morphological evidence for water flowing with, for example, uh, an alluvial fan over there co connected to channels and also channels carving all the rim of the crater, showing that water was, was forming those channels millions of and billions of years ago. So a pretty nice site in terms of, uh, of where place, place to where to go, but then also a super, a super nice uh, uh, instrument set to study this, this place with the Curiosity rover. So this rover, you've got a little image over there to compare to the previous generation of rover. The first one being set in 1997. Uh, it was, I didn't see it live, but I, I'm always told that it was uh, more or less the, the size of a shoebox. And now we've got a rover that is 900 kilograms with 10 instruments on board. And uh, in terms of, of classification, uh, we've got different categories of instruments. So in, in green, what you can see is the so-called environmental instruments that are, for example, the meteorological sensor uh, provided by, by a Spanish team. We've got analytical laboratories. So, um, so it's actually 
um, a set over there, you can see two, two instruments that have, they can process much more detailed analysis and they are located in the body, what we call the body of the rubber. Uh, so this part, so there is, for example, the chemin instrument that provides the mineralogy. Uh, what one thing about those instruments is that they're not connected directly to the outside, so it's actually the arm over there that uh, can move and that can sample uh, the, the rocks or the soil surrounding and provide the sample to the instruments that are located inside. Uh, but they, those instruments carry, can assess much de more detailed analysis. And all the instruments that are located on the arm are also called the contact one with, for example, the apexes that can give a composition of the targets. And what we have in terms of remote sensing instrument located on what we call the mast of the rover is, uh, is a set of cameras, color and black and white, and also the, one, the instruments I'm gonna focus on today, so the cam cam instrument. The chem chem instrument, okay, so it stands for chemistry and camera. And the reason uh, I'm, I can speak about it today, even if this is a NASA mission, uh, why a French postdoc speaking about it, it's because it's a collaboration between US and France. It's not the only instrument on board Curiosity that is a uh, collaboration, an, an international collaboration, but this is indeed a, a US-France one. And uh, you can see a, s whoop, you can see a self-portrait due, uh, done on, on Mars or with the chem, -chem instruments being, being here. So let's focus a little bit on the technique of, of this instrument. So we said chemistry and camera, and this is because it's composed of two parts, one doing the chemistry and a little camera that give us the context for the analysis. So in terms of composition, of chemi chemistry composition, the, the way it works, it uses the, the so-called LIPS, laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. It's a technique that has been known on Earth uh, since a couple of decades, uh, the, the 60s, uh, more or less. And uh, the way it, it works, the LIPS principle, we've got the, the, the little schematic over there on the bottom. So there is a laser emission that is sent from the mast, uh, from the ChemCam instruments located on the mast. This laser emission is very fast, but is powerful enough in terms of energy to ablate and to create a plasma at the surface of the target that we want to analyze. It, it creates ions, so all the elements that are present in the target that is being analyzed are converted into ions, and the plasma that is emitted, this light is collected back and brought back to spectrometers that are inside the rubber, and what we get is uh, a set of uh, spectral uh, emission spectra, so you can see here, for example, the three channels that we have between 240 and 900 nanometers with every single uh, chemical element that was present in the target emitting a set of peaks at very precise uh, wavelengths that allow to identify them. So um, one, one point, one characteristic of this analysis is that the, the size, the sample size, does anyone have an idea of the sample size that a laser can create at the surface of a Martian rock? Because sometimes we've got images of, of on press release with a big, like a big boom. It's not it's not one meter size analysis. Any any idea of the size? Micro, micro yeah, yeah. It's 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 less than one millimeter. The diameter of analysis it's uh, 0.5 millimeters in size, so for that, it means that if you want to analyze a target that is between two and seven meters, because this is the capacity of the ChemCam instrument, you wanna have an image, a picture of what you are analyzing, because otherwise you will not know exactly where you have sample. So this is why there is also the RMI that stands for the remote micro imager that is part of the ChemCam instrument and that provides a context image, as you can see each, each little uh, red cross being a sample, uh, uh, a little laser analysis, but so just to show you quickly, also as, as Jen mentioned, is it was the first time this technique uh, was being specialized, even if it was known on Earth for a couple of, of, of decades. So here is um, what I call the typical chem, chem analysis to show you a little bit uh, quickly how it works in terms of, of operation, day-to-day -day operation at the surface of Mars on board the rover. So there is a target selection the, the team decides to analyze, to analyze a target, and what the ChemCam -chem team does is uh, to select 
uh, a precise part of this target and, and do various points of laser analysis to provide some statistics. So not only one point, but various. You've got the example of a raster of five, five laser points over there on an RMI images. Again, it's about the, the size of this analysis. And what uh, the ChemCam team does is that for each and every one of these spots, it does various uh, laser emissions. So typically for one spot, for example, point one in dark, we'll do 30 shots. So this has, is for various reasons. First is to do a little bit of variation in composition with depth, so we can have those statistics. Also, one big, uh, one, one important uh, reason to do that is to remove the dust, because uh, at the surface of Mars, there is just dust everywhere, so with the first laser shot, it removes the dust and allows to analyze precisely the underlying target. So we've got two emission spectra. Here is a portion of a leak spectra for, for example, 0.1 in dark and point. 0.5 in blue, and uh, usually we average to 30 shots to get a broad idea of one point emission. So the ChemCam analysis is something that gives us rapid remote from two to seven meters and without preparation of the sample uh, and providing also dust removal. And we've got the emission, the composition, the elemental composition. So just to mention how the team goes from the emission spectra with the elements to the composition, because this is what geologists and mineralogists want to have, is the, the percentage of the elements. It's not to say that you have iron and calcium, but sometimes it's very important to specialists to have the percentage of it. So there, there is part of the team that is dedicated to, uh, to work on the calibration and the, status, the statistical analysis of the spectra. And uh, what the result I represent is, is, uh, is a percentage of elements, a quantification of element composition given by a technique that is called the MOC, the mean oxal composition is the, the most updated technique used by the ChemCam team. So I'm going back now to the last keyword of my title, which is diagenetic features. Uh, because you still have half an hour to hear about diagenetic feature at the surface of Mars. So what do I mean from that? I'm taking the definition given by Larsen et al. And, and by that I mean all the processes, all the things that can affect a sediment once it has been deposited. So on Earth you've got these processes that erode the rocks that form clasts that are carried away and then deposited in the environment. And from the moment when they are deposited, to the long process that they undergo to be transformed in, in rocks, not only in loose sediment, but in rocks, all the processes that can affect them, if there are, uh, if some minerals are recrystallized in the inside, if there is circulation of fluids inside, if there is veins cutting them, this is diagenesis. And I'm focusing on uh, my work on those topics that tell us about what happened once the rock was deposited. The interest for that is that we have the history posterior to the sediment because some people understand, focus their research on understanding where the sediments were deposited. It's very different, the type of rock that you can get if it's formed in a lake or if it's formed in dunes, you will not form the same, the same rocks and you would like to know in which the environment they formed, but we will be, be interested more in, in knowing what happened to this sediment afterwards. So that's the, the interest of my, of my work here. In terms of results now, what I will present, I will do that just in two times. I've separated that in two times. In the first, uh, in the first 10 minutes, I will speak about one precise category of diagenetic feature that have been uh, analyzed by the ChemCam instrument. And uh, it's, uh, it's light on veins that have been observed along the, the Curiosity Traverse. And then in a second time, I will focus on uh, the diagenetic features that are diverse, uh, a, a typical assemblage of diagenetic features, but focusing on one region that is called the Parump Hill region. So let's start with the light on veins. So when I speak about light on veins, we were roaring, it's, it was, uh, maybe it's, it was a hundred souls, a hundred Martian days uh, since the rover had landed. And it was uh, roaring on, you can see in white, the rover path in this landing site ellipse. We, the Curiosity landed 
uh, pretty much in the center of the ellipse and then went to this region called Yellowknife Bay. You can see here a geological map, people working, uh, taking the images from orbit were already mapping uh, the, what, what the rover was about to see. And uh, Yellowknife Bay seemed to be from orbit even before the rover would arrive there. It seems to be quite interesting also because it was the intersection between three types of terrains, like in a very precise uh, area. So people were wondering what, what it could be. And uh, you can see over there since, there, since then, the path that the rover took and more or less uh, well, not so current position. It's been rubbing a little bit more. Um, by the way, any, any idea of what the, the dark, not, not Jen, but, but any idea of the, what the dark area is over there on the map? Because we've been rubbing along it, trying to avoid it. <laughs> Uh, again, sorry? Basaltic sand Basaltic sand dunes, yes. It's a, a dune field, a big dune field that the, the team has been trying to avoid not to get stuck in it because the Mount Sharp, the layers of sediments that I was mentioning before are located over there. So this would, this is the objective of the mission. But the rover has been driving all over there in order to reach it. Anyway, so landing over there, Yellowknife Bay, after only a couple of months, and this is a panorama that, that you could see arriving at Yellowknife Bay with the Mount Sharp located in the background. And um, in terms of analysis, the rover spent over there several weeks analyzing in, de in detail the rocks and the sediments that were there. And what the team found is that given the grain size and the characteristic of the rocks analyzed there, uh, they discovered that this area was indeed a former fluvial lacustrine area. So we had... Uh, we had a lake that was in this region, fitted by um, a, a lacustrine, a fluvial, a fluvial composition that was coming. Oops, sorry, struggling a little bit with the, the pointer. Up, being fed by this alluvial fan that was carving in the past uh, the crater rim. So, so all the rocks. And the sedimentary rocks presented over there that you can see in this panorama were formed in this fluvial lacustrine in this fluvial lacustrine environment. And looking a little bit more in detail at those, at those rocks, one thing that the team noticed uh, is that most of them were cut by these light on veins. So you can see a zoom on this RMI image over there. Again, something very thin, millimetric in terms of width, but that, that seems to be uh, cutting many of the rocks of the surface. So just a little background on Earth's context. When we do see veins like that on sedimentary or in, in rocks at the surface of, of Earth, uh, the, interpretation, the interpretation for that usually is that there have been fractures that uh, were filled up with minerals. And uh, depending on the minerals that were filling this fracture uh, and that were precipitating because of the fluid circulation, it can give us clues about what type of fluids were uh, were, were uh, just flowing across these fractures. So the interest for that is we are speaking about fluid circulating. So in terms of habitability, and 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 it's always a it's always a topic of interest. And for geologists to understand the context of which was forming there, it was interesting. So. ChemCam was able to analyze and to give to get the composition of that because even if these these targets are pretty small, uh, again the spatial resolution provides us both ChemCam laser shots on the veins. You can see the uh, the full the full spectra corresponding corresponding to the analysis of veins for this target and this target, and the one with a dash spectra correspond to the surrounding background to compare to see if it's just the same composition or what it is. And uh, you've got listed there the main uh, characteristic of the composition of those targets. Uh, if I am giving you the, the, the analysis at, as we analyzed it, like we were looking at the, major, uh, at the major characteristic of it, and what we noticed is that there was a big calcium enrichment. In those veins, compared to the host rock, if we were looking at the, the calcium peak, we could see that the veins were way enriched in calcium. They were also depleted in other major elements. So it was not carrying silicon, nor iron, nor magnesium, and other major elements. So it was a calcium phase. And uh, also, the ChemCam analysis provided the proof that we had sulfur peaks, sulfur present in those veins. And the interpretation for that is that we've got calcium sulfates. 
So this is a mineral that is typically formed on Earth because in processes of evaporation, uh, precipitating those, those sulfates. And it's not, it's not a big surprise to see sulfates on Mars. Actually, from orbit, from the orbital analysis, sulfates were previously uh, found at the surface of Mars, uh, around the pole, for example, but also in, in, in canyons like Valles Marineris with deposition. It's, it's typically a mineral formed by evaporation of water. And we've seen that we had a transition from an environment that was uh, carrying liquid water from something dry today. So it's actually a, a type of mineral that is, is happening on Mars. So in general, the types of sulfates that, uh, that are found at the surface of Mars are more magnesium and iron. So I will come back to that. So we've got this vein of calcium sulfates and uh, analyzing a bit more in detail the way they cut the sedimentary deposit. The interpretation we uh, we made is that well, if they cut the sediments, it means that the sediments were deposited, the, ro the the rocks were deposited first, and then the veins occurred, and also they were cutting uh, the rocks pretty sharply, so they were not being diffused in the sediment. So it means that uh, the rocks, the sediment, might have been compacted well enough in terms of uh, in their in their geological history, they had to be compacted well enough so that the veins could cut through and not diffuse in the sediment. So we've got fluid circulating after the sediment were deposited, and they had a composition of calcium sulfate. So on Earth, uh, if we look at this mineral, there, is, it's, there are three phases that uh, can, can exist, from dehydrated, which is called the anhydrite, to gypsum, that is the most hydrated. And all those minerals, uh, as, you, as you might know, have different field stabilities. They, uh, they will give clues about uh, if the environment was more, more or less hydrated, uh, given, uh, depending on the one that is formed, the phase that is formed. And, uh, Hydrogen, the hydration of a target with ChemCam is not a topic that is easy to assess for many, for many reasons. As you can see, the hydrogen peak is located nearby a carbon peak, so there is overlap between carbon and hydrogen. So to infer the precise amount of hydrogen in the calcium sulfate, given, given just the ChemCam spectra is not easy, but there is someone in the team working precisely on that. And we show that many of the phases, many of the veins that we have been analyzing with ChemCam are indeed hydrated. And more recently, a study by Rapin et al. showed that it might be bassanite. That's what, what we see. Uh, so based on that, there are people working on knowing precisely the conditions that those veins had to undergo to have bassanite and not gypsum, so more or less hydrated, more or less humid, etc. In if I uh, if we have a view of the yellow knife bay area deposit represented by this stratigraphic column, it's a couple of meters. Uh, what what we what we saw, we see uh, that the veins are indeed present from the bottom to the surface. So it really means that the fluid circulation at the scale of this region was affecting the entire area. One question, though, at that time, the question that we had is that. Was that local, like, and why? So what would be the extent of this fluid circulation? Would we see veins later? And we did, we saw, so since the Yellow Knife Bay, the rover has been driving more than 10 kilometers, again, following the, the dunes over there. And this is one of, of uh, a location where we were one year ago, and all the blue dots are chemical analysis performed on light on veins that show, again, a very similar composition, always this calcium enrichment associated to sulfur. And uh, what we, what we um, interpreted from that is that indeed the fluid circulation was regional, at least from Yellow Knife Bay to Parampils. And that uh, compared to other type of sulfates that could have formed and that form usually on Mars, we had uh, an environment that was relatively non-acidic, not as much as, for example, iron sulfate or magnesium sulfate could point out. And uh, one thing that I like to mention is that those veins were not visible from orbit. You can see that sometimes in images in situ, they are barely visible. So it's actually a very nice example of something that in the history of Gale had been missed from orbit, but we had fluid circulating well after those sediments were formed and, and those results prove it. So it doesn't mean that we understand, of course, everything about it. There are still many questions, uh, many people working on different parts of those questions in the team and outside the team. What is the source for this fluid? 
where this comes from, even from above, from below, well, it's, it's not super easy to constrain. Uh, what is the extent of that? That's in, in an, an ongoing question. We keep seeing veins uh, since, since then, but what, what's the real extent in that and what's the precise timing? Because here I'm speaking about relative timing, as you, as you might have noticed, uh, but what's the precise timing of that in terms of millions of years? It's, it's very hard to constrain. So many questions, but, but still, we have to start with something. So and now I will jump on my second category of results, which is the study of, this time, not one type of diagnostic target, but let's focus on one zone that was in my previous map, which is called the Parump Hill area. So from Yellowknife Bay, to driving 10 kilometers mostly, arriving to Parump Hills. So parent Hills from orbit was uh, something that the team was expected uh, long away because it's, it's part of the very first basal layers of Mount Sharp. So finally reaching the base of this mount, uh, that was the reason why the Curiosity, was, uh, the Curiosity rover was sent over there. So, uh, so yes, this between among the different type of layers composing the Mount Sharp, can see in green there the Murray formation and parent peels being the very first uh, exposure of heat that the rover has reached. So this is a panorama taken by the mass cam images. We've got the Mount Sharp in the background over there. And uh, what the rover did, what the team did uh, this area arriving is that it performed three loops. So uh, a map from the orbit shows that you can see it's a pretty complex path. And for the, first, uh, for the first loop, what was done is an overview. So using mainly, mainly the CamCam -cam instrument to have an overview. And once the team had clear, clearly enough what targets were the most interesting, they came back and they, did, they performed more detailed analysis. So using also the drill that takes a lot of time to, to operate. So, uh, so actually the team spent 200 Martian days uh, 200 souls working on this area, and um, just to summarize the interpretation of this of this area of those sedimentary deposits is that they were indeed formed in a, in a, in a complex also fluvial lacustrine channels uh, arriving to a, a, a lake in this area. And looking more in detail at those sediments, at what was cutting them and crisscrossing them, we saw a diversity. In, in terms of very tiny target, millimetric target, you can have a look at the, at the size of, of those, both on mass cam images in color and RMI cam cam images in black and white. So we had what I call here the dendritic features, things that were kind of dendritic in morphology. Uh, as you can see, millimetric again, we have all this category that is broad that we classify just as a broad category of locally resistant outcrop that had a bit crazy shape sometimes, seems more resistant, resistance enough not to be eroded. And uh, as you can see there, some ridges also, and again, light on veins. So what I, I they were, all of these categories were analyzed in detail thanks to the, the CamCam laser. And I will go through the main ones to show you that how we try to analyze their composition and the result that we got. Because one of the question was, is that just awestruck? Just showing a little bit of variation, but so what we show is that each and every category has a precise composition. So let's start with the dendritic feature. So you can see a precise type of shape, a bit, a bit dendritic, millimetric uh, size. And by looking at the ChemCam analysis on it, one of the main results of, from their composition was to see, compared to the host truck, a magnesium enhancement. So we had something that, was, that is embedded over there, but that shows a magnesium enhancement. And if we take the other major elements that usually the mineralogists and geochemists look at, we've seen a depletion in other elements. So we've got here something that is a magnesium phase uh, with apparently no other major elements present. Or, um, and the question is, what is this magnesium phase? So the basic thing to do with that is to look to other elements and to see if there is a correlation with the magnesium. So on, on Earth, one of the, the first thing to look, to look at in terms of minerals would be, is it a silicate? 
we've seen that the silicon is depleted, but is it a silicate? Well, apparently, we can see in those diagrams, in those magnesium over silicon diagram, I've plotted the dendritic feature in red compared to the local host rock in gray, and I plot also the calcium sulfate vein for reference because they, are, they have this particular, this very peculiar composition. So there is app no apparent correlation between magnesium and silicon, so we don't have a silicate. Now, sometimes magnesium in minerals is associated with iron. Looking at iron, we don't have correlation between magnesium and iron. So looking at more ele other elements that could correspond, what we notice is that we had some sulfur peaks, not the best one that we had, so not something as clear as in the calcium sulfate vein, but there is sulfur in this target. And the interpretation leading also to the fact that we do have oxygen in this target, but the long story short, we think we have magnesium sulfates over there in this precise target. Um, in terms of hydration, we tried looking a little bit more in detail at dehydration to see uh, for the specialist of magnesium, what kind of magnesium sulfate we had more or less hydrated. It seems to be weakly hydrated. Anyway, there are also something that we still, well, I still don't know exactly how to interpret. There was nickel in this target. It was the first time that we uh, actually saw nickel in our ChemCam -chem targets. And uh, I still don't know exactly what role it plays over there, but it was a characteristic of this, of this uh, type of target. It's a bit of a Sherlock Holmes game because we we might expect some things that sometimes we get, but sometimes we don't get. So we also have to kind of think like Martians. This is a different word. So even if we might be looking for silicates or whatever, it might not be what we might find. So it's it's a, it's a tricky game that many of you know. Um, so going back to another category, just to look at the, we had those locally resistant of crop. Looking at that composition, they seem also enhancing magnesium. Uh, they don't have the exact same composition, apparently, as the previous one. So, so we were wondering if fluid circulated with magnesium sulfate composition, did they also affect some other part of the ostrock? And if it seems a bit more resistant to the erosion because it sticks out from the, from the normal uh, outcrop. So is that cementing the rock, for example? Did we have magnesium sulfate cement? It's one of the interpretations that, uh, that, that is done by the team. Just to mention another target, which is called the uh, the parampil, the parampil, the Iden Peak target. There was one point analysis in one of the target that had a very distinct composition, not completely distinct from everything else that we've seen. Uh, let's see, just to have a look in blue and yeah, in blue purple, you've got here calcium sulfate vein spectra for reference with enhanced calcium, enhanced calcium sulfur. Uh, in, in dashed, I like to plot the local host truck to compare. And in green is this hidden peak target that correspond to this, uh, to this weird shape, resistant shape. And, and here we see on the green spectra a very enhanced iron content and also sulfur peaks. So we might have uh, iron sulfate in this, at this precise location. And as we also have uh, uh, Na sodium present over there, it might be a phase that's called the natural gyrosite. And if it's the case that we have an iron sulfate, it would, uh, people on us working on those minerals tell us that it's, it points to very more acidic, much more acidic environment than calcium sulfate. So by having one other mineral, it might tell you that the conditions were, were pretty different. Jumping on the one of the last categories, we had calcium. Uh, we had light on veins at parampils. They show the same calcium sulfate composition uh, as I mentioned previously. So I will be quick on that. And the very last type of diagenetic feature that we saw that uh, that were at parampils uh, is this the so-called garden city outcrop. So this outcrop, as you can see, uh, is is a couple of tens of, of centimeters in wide. And we had a precise, a very peculiar um, associate, association of both light on veins and also dark on veins. You can see, you can, as you can see over there, and this is a Mali image taken by the, the imager that is located uh, on, the, on the arm of the rover. So looking at the difference in composition between the light on part and the dark on part was something that ChemCam uh, did. You can see the laser analysis over there. And while the light on material seems to be calcium sulfate again, 
uh, the dark tone material seems to uh, have been interpreted as fluoride because we see an enhancement in calcium and also a fluor, which is something we don't see very, uh, we hadn't seen previously with the rubber. So I just plot the composition in terms of calcium and silicon, the dark uh, diamonds being the, the dark tone materials at Garden City, and you can see a spectra showing uh, a calcium, a CAF emission, mo molecular emission in those uh, dark tone veins. So fluorite on Earth, uh, we've got veins of fluorite formed in hydrothermal system, for example. It's not the unique uh, for formation possible. And one of the questions raised by the team is that, are we looking at an outcrop that was formed by hydrothermal fluids? So the context of this area doesn't give us clue about if it's true or not. We don't have uh, a little volcano just over there, but it's, this is a, a, an impact crater. So it has it had undergo in, in the past. Uh, hydrothermal, uh, hydrothermalism, it's something that happens once when you have an impact. So we are, we are poorly constrained. It's, it's a very specific outcrop that we had, but a very distinct composition that some people in the team are still working on to try to understand precisely. Uh, just plotting quickly again in the same uh, process of looking at the outcrop uh, analyzed at the, at the Parham Hills area, uh, plotting the stratigraphic column by Cathy Stack, uh, plotting the different categories. We can see that the dendritic feature are located mostly at the base, so apparently whatever this magnesium sulfate fluid uh, was, it seems to have circulated uh, and mostly at the bottom of it, while the, for example, the calcium sulfate vein, again, affect the entire stack of sediments over there. So we have a complex history from uh, this magnesium rich sulfate located at the base and this light invades that are present in all units and the, gar the garden city outcrop located at a precise, at a very precise part of the outcrop. Uh, and in terms of, again, of relative history, because we, have, we are poorly constrained in terms of absolute ages, but in terms of relative history, what we can say is that once the sediments were deposited, at some point we had uh, the magnesium-rich uh, dendritic features forming, but maybe they started forming when the sediments were deposited. And we've got the, dark, the garden city veins formed, and the light on veins are posterior to that, crisscrossing all of this. So it's relative, it's relative history, but it's, uh, it gives us clue precise enough to tell that indeed we form very different minerals over there. So the conditions were, might have been very different to form all of this, but there are people proposing that it might be a redox, a change of redox condition in this environment that might have provided all, uh, all this set of composition. There, are, there is an interpretation saying that an in situ acidic alteration of the, the sediments might have formed this set of features. So this is ongoing work by, by the team, and I think there will be results presented at, at EGU about it. So if I summarize all of this, uh, the interest of those two big results is that either if it's all the diagenic features that are complex uh, at parent pills, or either if it's the light on veins with calcium sulfate composition circulating through the old, mostly all the sedimentary units that we've been analyzing up to now with curiosity, we had fluid circulating even after that these sediments were formed in the fluvial lacustrine area. So for people working on habitability and fluid interest, uh, it might be interesting for, for them knowing those, those results. And uh, this is just a little, uh, a little spoiler for, from results more recently obtained with alteration halos that have been observed by the Curiosity team more, more recently. So with that, I leave it there and thank you very much for your attention. That was awesome. <laughs> we have some time for questions. Very nice presentation. So are the Parup Hills, are they uh, st stratigraphically superposed on top of the, of the Lacustrian sediments that were initially explored by uh, Curiosity? So um, in, in the last um, paper published by, by John Krotzinger et al, uh, looking at the stratigraphic column, they put Yellowknife Bay uh, at the bottom of the uh, of the stratigraphic column but looking at the text they discuss that depending on on people that have been mapping uh, that from orbit 
it, it might be something that is actually more recent, the alluvial fan that we see connected to Yellowknife Bay being indeed younger. But the, the stratigraphic column uh, presented in the science paper lets let Yellowknife Bay at the bottom. So uh, alien mons might actually be younger than everything that was deposited uh, in the lake. Is that possible? Uh, so, so I don't know if it's possible because I haven't looked, to be fair, at the images from, from orbit. Um, all the work that is done by the team for mapping from orbit the relation between this. Uh, the constraints that we have, uh, as you know, in terms of, of age of the terrains is provided by crater counting. So given that, we know that the crater formation itself, it's 3.8, 3.7 billion years. Uh, and in terms of formation of the other terrains, we have the constraints at Yellowknife Bay of the age of the sediments themselves, the exposure. We have sometimes exposure that is provided uh, by SAM analysis, I guess, by cosmogenic and radiogenic uh, 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 elements that tell us from how long these sediments have been exposed. But apart from that, there is only yet yeah, the mapping, the mapping word that might give us the clue. And this is where the team is providing different options and people working from with orbital images might disagree at some at some point. Thank you very much. My question deals with um, uh, the length of time liquid water is on the surface. It sounds as if it might be transient rather than sustained. And if that's the case, what does it have to say? What does that say about how life might have formed? Oh. So uh, about the life, I will not jump on, on that because I, I'm, I'm not precise enough in this domain to, to know exactly what it might main, mean for, for life. But uh, given the stack of sediment deposited at Yellowknife Bay, for example, in the papers published in the science paper, again, Grotzinger 2013, given the stack of sediments, they came up with rates of deposits. And from that, they could uh, have some hypotheses on for how long the water, the lake, would have needed to be to be there. So I guess if I'm not mistaken, the the range would be uh, between thousands of years to thousand to thousands of years. And also given the composition of the of the for example the clays that have been found uh, at Yellowknife Bay, they came out to the fact that the water might have it should have been there for long enough to create those alteration minerals that require sometimes to form. So I guess I guess that's the constraints that we can have on for how long the water has been there, yeah, the sedimentary deposits and both the mineralogical uh, clues. I think yeah, it's pretty much the constraint that we have. Constraint. Yeah. Mm. Hello, over here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Um, so. Uh, you, you started by saying that the sediments were like a book, and I'm kind of curious how far into the book you guys are and what the translation problems are. And at some point, the, the highest water level existed, right? There was like the biggest lake ever when at some point in the history. Mm -hmm. And so at some point, I assume curiosity is going to climb above the high water mark. And will that be a sharp thing, or no pun intended, or a, uh, a kind of a fuzzy thing that people are going to argue about? And will you see, what kind of changes will you see? And, and how much of the book will you have read at, at that point? Huh. So OK, let's take that part to part from what I know to what, uh, that what has been published. So um, I, what I know from the lake deposits is that I'm not sure we can say that it's been one lake, for example, that as we mentioned previously, it might be a lake and then water level going down and then rising again. So I'm not sure if we have, I'm not sure that we have like sharp boundaries of, of this lake uh, or lakes. So that's for the, the first part. And, and then, uh, yeah, if we jump from this to what we'll see at Mont Sharp, what we see from orbit is that we have a variety of uh, minerals um, that I have over there. So one of the things is that people were saying that we had sulfate. If we look at the base of the mound, we have yeah sulfate more at the bottom going no again sulfate at the top at the most at the higher 
elevation with smectites and phyllosilicate located at the bottom. So people were in Thompson, I guess, or Millikan uh, papers, they were saying that maybe we had the transition there at the bottom of Montrop from an environment forming phyllosilicate, so more, more hydrated to sulfate pointing to evaporation deposits. So I don't know if we'll see a clear transition to that. I haven't looked at the, the mineralogical from orbit. I'm not familiar with that. Yes, yeah. Mm. No, 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 thanks. So uh, the, the question was more if, if we would reach that and go, go for it. OK, yeah, so. OK. Considering the data that we've got for the, on the sediments, is it possible to get a detailed enough view of the chemistry of the lake to determine biocompatibility? Okay, so the question is, do we have enough constraint to uh, have clues about the composition of the lake? Right, like right, the right? chemistry, the okay. chemical composition of okay. the lake. So at Ilonai Bay, for example, uh, at Ilonai Bay, for example, the fact that we had some types of minerals, uh, some some types of smectites rather than other type of phyllosilicates, and other arguments point out to the fact that indeed, the, what I keep hearing is that the water was not uh, drinkable, but it was friendly enough in terms of people working with, with life purpose. It was not too acidic, Not it was pretty much neutral. It's what we see, for example, in, in the McLennan paper, the science paper presenting the, the chemistry at Yellowknife Bay, and also the Vanniman paper uh, presenting the mineralogy. So apparently neutral, circumneutral water at least for, for, this, for this lake. So I guess, you, you tell me, but I guess for habitability, it might sound better than something very, very much acidic or very much basic, but you are the experts. What do you think caused the cracks that got filled in with uh, that calcium sulfate? The, the cracks, the, okay. So uh, based on what, what we see on Earth, sometimes it's the fluid itself that provides enough pressure, hydro, how do you call that in English? I, hydrostatic, thank you, hydrostatic pressure to form this fissure, so it, to, to form this fracture. So if, we, if you have uh, these fluids trying to circulate and you have uh, a deposit of sediment on the top providing pressure because it's being buried, you might provide this pressure when else to have circulation through and creating fracture through the sediments on the top. Okay. Could it be the thing is drying out, and it when it dries out, the drying out sort of opens up a crack, or not really? I I guess so. I don't know if I I'm not sure. I would be able to distinguish that, but I wanted to think that geologists would be able, look looking at the at the detail, for example, uh, texture of the veins, seeing in which direction they've been growing. If it were they were forming, because the fluid was circulating, so they were forming by precipitating the calcium sulfate from the inside or to the outside of the fissure. It's something we can look at uh, on Earth, antitaxial or syntaxial growing. So this can provide clue, but we don't have always a very precise imagery of the veins to, say, to tell that everywhere. Um, are, you, are, you asking, are you asking which came first, the fractures of the fluid? In, in kind of dried out clay, you often see cracks. So I was wondering if it was something like it dried out first and then more fluid came in and then that more fluid created the, the calcium sulfate. Yeah, why not? Why not? It's one of the questions that we have, that I've been presenting, for example, at EPC about the halos that I've been, that I've been showing in my last slide is 
was that before? That's re reaction and halos. Yes. And, and as is the case <coughs> with many Good. geologic processes, it's usually a combination of things. <laughs> so um, it, well, it's likely that here. And uh, we have another question, yes. and then we'll take one more. I noticed that the northern part of Gale Crater is lower than the southern part. Absolutely. Is there any thought that the feature may have tilted slightly since its formation? Ah, the, the sedimentary deposit that we have. Uh, well, at Yellowknife Bay, the, what we see is pretty much horizontal. So, so if, if, yeah, it doesn't seem to have been affected related to that. Uh, that that's right. That's a, a big a big thing that the north of the the crater is lower, but the sediments that we see, the deposit that we see at Yellowknife Bay are pretty much horizontal. That's why, thanks to that, we can estimate better the thickness of of the entire stack. At Parampilus, they they are a little bit tilted, but I'm not sure they're tilted to the north. So I'm not sure it's the it's it's a direct relation between well, between the two. If the sediments are deposit of the liquid, the liquid's going to stay level, yes. even if the crater tilts. Agreed. So it might, we might not, the point is that we might not see it anyway, you mean? I bet. Yeah, might, might seem logical. So do we have another question? Oh, good. Tell us something about the technology of the laser, the wavelength, and the spectrometer. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's go for that. So Wait, you asked that question at the end of the talk. <laughs> well, I mean better that. now. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> no. if, it's, if it's the last question, better ask it now. <laughs> okay. So um, what I know about the I laser. I said that because it's a long. I mean, there's a lot of detail. <laughs> Again, sorry. The the laser itself, uh, it's 164 nanometers. That's why it's we represent it as a as a red uh, laser. Excuse me. Just the time to go back to that. <laughs> Uh, in terms of, of range, of spectral range, so we can see uh, emission spectra between 200, 240 nanometers to 900. So we have these three uh, channels, both in UV, bit of Vs, and FNIR channels. Uh, what can I tell you about it more than that? Uh, it's, up, up. it's a KCW laser that f is ah. essentially selected Thank you. for being effective at low temperature and uh, firing at low energy. So it's typically at 13 millijoules um, per firing. Ooh. I think around that, like, uh, like that. Uh, at this and I'd have to, at this point, I have to go back and look, <laughs> look up the yeah. specs. Oh, what's the spectral resolution? The spectral resolution. Um, it's point something, half a nanometer. Mm. Yeah, in, in terms of special, yeah. oh, in yeah, terms yeah. of special, so sorry? No, no, spectral. spectral resolution. No, oh. Okay, okay, the spectral resolution. Well, it, that what I know it does is varies a little bit from from channels, but I can't recall the, the precise the precise value <laughs> the, for the it. The rover's been going for um, a while, we'd have to go look it up now. Yeah, yeah, no, fair enough. <laughs> That's uh, less, I think, yeah, it's less than that. Yeah, no, no, so, sorry, I don't want to say anything crazy because because what I, when I ask myself this question, I always look at the different channels to be sure that when I identify something, I see it also in the different channels. But that's but, because but you're the actually, she's actually right. So you can see even on the scale, well, not here on the scales, I guess, but uh, the the UV and the vis are um, more sensitive than the near IR. The uh, near IR. Yeah, because so. for example, we can still distinguish between uh, the the hydrogen. There is this overlap between the hydrogen and the and the carbon. Uh, so I guess that might give us give us an idea. But yeah, I don't want to say just numbers because I, I won't I won't be true about the precise number. Sorry about that. Um, okay, I actually have one final question. Um, and I, as as your, as your, the rover has been moving along section, has there been, been, any, been any systematic change in the thickness of the veins that we've seen in general, and also in the complexity in terms of the number of generations of fractures cross cr cutting one another that we can see? Oh, okay. So th there is except for Garden City, which is a mess. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's 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 a very nice but complicated outcrop. Um, so in in terms of variation of size. Uh, we still don't know if it's associated with the type of, with the resistivity of the rock because we, we've been through mudstone and sandstone. So there are some places where they are thicker, but it might be just related to the difference in terms of, uh, of thickness of the sediment of grain size. Uh, so we keep seeing millimetric, uh, millimetric veins in terms of width. Uh, the biggest outcrop that we, that we had seen 
well, yeah, Parampid was was the uh, one of the big ones, and there is there is Rachel Kroniak working on on that within within the team, looking precisely at at the distribution of size. And yes, now the latest one seems to be associated with the halos, and again, they are very they are millimetric uh, in size. So there will <coughs> be more talks about this at the fall meeting of the American Geophysical Union yes. in, in December, and there will probably be accompanying press releases. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, but anyway, um, so I want to essentially, on behalf of SETI, present you, Marianne, with this um, token of our appreciation. Oh. <laughs> um, um, a SETI mug <laughs> nice. for, for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, please join me in uh, thanking Marianne again. Thank you.